Okay, we're in Matthew chapter 20, starting at verse 29. We're going to go through to chapter 21, verse 22. The title of this message is Religious Pretenders. Let's read. Matthew 20, verse 29. And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes. And immediately they recovered their sight and followed him. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethpage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, The Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would bless us with clarity today that you would help me to be clear, that your word would be clear to all of us here today. I pray that you take away all pretense and hypocrisy, 
And I pray that there would be fruit now here in our midst as a result of looking at your word. Amen. So let's go through this bit by bit. Verse 29. And as he went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. Now, remember, as we've gone through the Gospel of Matthew, we've seen that Matthew's interested in how people respond to Jesus. It's not the only thing he's interested in, but it's one of his themes, it appears. How do people respond to Jesus? And we've seen before in the Gospel of Matthew that when people respond to Jesus asking for mercy, that appears to be the right way to go to Jesus. But not everyone goes to Jesus like that. But in this instance, these men, these blind men, they say, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And notice that first they call him Lord. So first they're acknowledging that Jesus is their Lord. Second, they're asking for mercy. Now why are they asking for mercy? When do you ask for mercy from someone? When you know that you don't deserve their help. That's when you ask for mercy. When you think you do deserve someone's help, you're not going to say, oh, please give me mercy. You're just going to say, give me what you owe me. But these blind men realize <laughs> that Jesus doesn't owe them anything. And so, and they realize they're on the wrong side of Jesus. And they say, have mercy on us, son of David. Why do they bother asking for mercy? If they know that, you know, that Jesus doesn't owe them anything, what's their reason for thinking they might get mercy? It's here where they call him son of David. In other words, when they call him son of David, the Jewish people were waiting for a descendant of the King David to come who would be the Messiah, God's anointed one who would save his people. So they recognize that even though they're blind, they, they recognize that this Jesus who's been going around healing people is the Messiah. He's the son of David they've been waiting for. And so they're asking for mercy only because they know it's in his nature to be merciful. Only because that's what the son of David does. He has mercy on people. So they ask for mercy knowing that it's in the Messiah's nature to give mercy to those who ask for it and they ask for their eyes to be opened they don't ask for riches or wealth they ask for their eyes to be opened and notice that it's only through Jesus the son of David that you find mercy this is the way God ordained it he said I'm going to send a Messiah he's going to be a descendant of David and this is the one you can get mercy through. And that's really important because you probably notice in this day and age, a lot of people say, well, all the different religions, they're okay. As long as people trust in God, everything's fine. You've even got so-called evangelical evangelists now on TV refusing to say that Jesus is the only way and saying, well, God looks at their heart. And it's tragic that that is being said right now. Because this is the way God ordained it, through his son. You can only get mercy through Jesus Christ. And that also means it's no good saying, well, you know, I access God through the Spirit. Someone else says, I access God through, I focus on the Father heart of God. No, you go to God through Jesus. This is how it's been ordained. There is no other way. I'm not saying don't pray to God the Father. I'm not saying don't pray to the Holy Spirit. I'm saying we all find our way to the Father through Jesus Christ and only through Jesus Christ. Amen. So they go to Jesus this way and then look at the crowd. Verse 31, the crowd rebuked them. So the crowd tells them off, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. So the crowd, now the crowd's with Jesus, and they're obviously feeling quite good about themselves. They're with Jesus. Maybe they're listening to Jesus talking. And suddenly these blind men 
They're shouting out, Lord, have mercy on us. And they're thinking, be quiet, go away. We're trying to listen to Jesus. Or maybe they're thinking, you're blind beggars. Go away. Let us religious people in our suits look good over here. And what you see here is religiosity. The crowds are hanging around with Jesus thinking they're good. And you've got a blind person asking for mercy and they're thinking, get away from here. Makes you wonder, what would we do if one Sunday someone, say a homeless person sitting at the back suddenly stood up and said, I want to be saved. Would we say, praise God, let's pray with you now. Or would we say, sit down, the sermon's going on right now. If it's the latter thing we do, then we're being religious people, but we're really being religious pretenders. But fortunately, the crowd are not, sorry, the blind men are not stopped by this fake religious crowd. And they cry out even louder for mercy, and look what Jesus does in verse 32. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? Now I'm sure Jesus knew what they wanted, but Jesus is giving them an opportunity to express their faith here. Which just goes to show that even though God knows everything we need, there's nothing wrong with us expressing to him what we need, even though we know he knows. (laughs) Because he wants to be in a relationship with us. Because he's a merciful God. And they say in verse 33, Lord, let our eyes be opened. They don't pretend to be anything special. You know, there's other people that went to Jesus trying to be a bit clever, didn't they? Like, Lord, what, what commandment must I keep to gain eternal life? These just go to him, we're blind. Open our eyes. They're upfront and honest about it. Not like the crowd around Jesus who are saying, oh, be quiet. They go to Jesus with their problem and they ask Jesus to open their eyes. Which just goes to show we don't need to put on a show when we go to Jesus. And verse 34, and Jesus in pity touched their eyes and immediately they recovered their sight and followed them. So we see here that Jesus actually feels pity for them. He has compassion for them because again, he is a merciful God. And he touches their eyes and immediately they are healed. And the point that Matthew's making here also is that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah. Because there was a prophecy in Isaiah 29.18 that said, In that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. And you've probably heard it before that there's no record of miracles of, of the blind seeing before. So when Jesus starts opening the eyes of the blind, it was clear to the people in that day that the Messiah was here. And Matthew is wanting to make this clear that the Messiah was Jesus Christ. Remember that Matthew is probably primarily writing to Jewish Christians in his gospel. So he's giving them the evidence that Jesus is a fulfillment of the Old Testament. And now in chapter 21, verse 1. Now when they drew near to Jerusalem... And came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. Now why does Jesus need two donkeys? You've got a... A very young donkey, a colt, and then you've got an older one next to it. Well, most probably it's the colt's parent, yeah? Probably the colt's mother. And so, or colt's father. So what you've got going on here is Jesus, he's about to ride on the little donkey. That's never been ridden before, yeah? If you look in the other gospel accounts, I think it's in Mark It's not been ridden before, and in those days, you wouldn't use a donkey for the first time without its parent being with it, 
I mean, that, that's fair enough, isn't it? I mean, you know, you, you don't send your kids off to school the first day, uh, just open the front door of your house and say, go off to school. And I imagine what would happen with the donkey is it would freak out a bit if you try sitting on it. So Jesus is going to sit on this little baby donkey and he's going to have the parent of the donkey with it. So that's why there's two. And he says in verse three, if anyone asks anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Now, one or two things is going on here. Either it's a miracle. Um, and when I was a child, this used to really mystify me. I used to wonder what was going on. Is it some like Jedi mind trick? The master needs them. And they go, ooh. I mean, I don't know. I mean, may, maybe it, they just said the master needs them. It was a miracle, and someone suddenly like, take my donkey. But we see in John's gospel that Jesus has already had dealings in Jerusalem and it could well be that there's someone in Jerusalem who knows that Jesus is coming and when he says the Lord needs him, he knows it's Jesus and he says, yeah, take him. I don't know, but I don't think that's the main part of the, the story here. But this is the main bit in verse four. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet saying, say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So the point Matthew's making is that when Jesus rolled into town on a donkey, it was a fulfillment of messianic prophecy. It was a fulfillment of Zechariah 9 verse 9, which we know that the Jews saw as a messianic prophecy. They were waiting for this to be fulfilled. And Matthew's actually joined two prophecies there together because you've also got Isaiah 62, 11. Now, you might think, well, that's an easy prophecy to fulfill. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is an easy prophecy to fulfill, to ride on a, a donkey. But it shows that Jesus was doing actions to show that he was the Messiah. In other words, Jesus believed himself to be the Messiah. So, you know, you talk to people sometimes on the street and they say, well, no, Jesus didn't think he was a Messiah. Well, then you say to them, why did Jesus choose to ride on a donkey into Jerusalem if he didn't think he was a Messiah? Because let's face it, if any of us thought we were, if we got deluded and thought we was a Messiah and we were going to go into central London, would we pick a donkey? You're not going to pick a donkey. I, I mean, me, I'd have a white stallion or a black stallion, you know. And, and Jesus turns up on a donkey. So he deliberately picks an animal that is referred to in an Old Testament prophecy talking about how the Messiah was going to come to the daughter of Zion, which is basically the people of Jerusalem. And the whole point of the donkey is that it shows he's humble. Because look, it says there, your king is coming to you humble and mounted on a donkey. And this is not how the people of Jerusalem were really expecting Jesus to come, which is interesting because it's there in Zechariah 9.9. 9. But they were expecting the Messiah to come and free them from the Romans. Remember that the area is, Palestine is controlled by Romans. And the Jews are there waiting for this Messiah to turn up one day and destroy all the Romans and elevate the position of the Jews and then they'd be really happy. That's what they're expecting. So they would really be thinking Jesus is going to come on this stallion, you know, wielding a sword and chopping off the heads of the Romans. But instead, Jesus comes humble. And this is important because here we got a clue that the way the people are expecting Jesus to be is not the way Jesus really is. And I bet there's many things in our head that are ideas about Jesus that are not really the way that Jesus is. We need to be careful about that and safeguard about that by being saturated with Scripture and asking God to open our eyes as we look at Scripture. So now, verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. So, you know, the cloaks are like a kind of makeshift saddle thing. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. 
And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever put your coat on the floor for someone or suddenly cut off branches and put them on the floor for someone. It's not a practice we do in Roehampton. Um, But if we go to the Old Testament, we see a time when people did this. In 2 Kings 9.12, about Jehu, it says, And they said, This is not true. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and so he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. So this is about Jehu. Then verse 13. Then in haste, every man of them took his garment and put it under him on the bare steps. And they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. So you can see an Old Testament example. When they hear that someone is king, then they put their clothes on the ground so that he can go over them. And it's a sign they're recognizing this person is the king. So when we go back to Matthew 21, we see that the people are recognizing Jesus as their king. That's quite significant because some people will say that they didn't see him as their king. But I think the Old Testament example shows they did. And they also say, Hosanna, which means save. It changed its meaning a bit over time. But if it's still retaining some of its original meaning, they're actually saying save as part of their praise. It was an exclamation of praise. But they're also saying save us. But what do they want to be saved from? They want to be safe from the Romans, yeah, the Roman occupation. Just like sometimes people come to church wanting to be safe from their financial problems. And there's bigger problems going on, which is sin. But people don't always want to be safe from that. People come to church, they want to be safe from family problems, personal problems, whatever problems there are. Not realizing that problems we face are byproducts of sin. Sin is the root problem of everything but people don't get that I saw an advert on a on a bus stop the other day some famous celebrity who's dead now it said prostate cancer cost me my life and I thought how interesting that people think that cancer didn't cost him his life sin did we know that from the Bible the wages of sin is death we all die because of sin because Adam sinned we sin we all die but our society is always looking to other things as the problem to be saved from, instead of realizing we need to be saved from our sin. They do recognize him as the Messiah because they call him son of David, just like the blind people. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So they knew he was doing God's work, but they're thinking God's work is all about saving us from the Romans. And they like that. So they're praising him, saying, Hosanna in the highest. They're very happy about this. They like the idea of the Savior. But in a few days, they're going to be shouting something different. In a few days, they're going to be shouting, crucify him. Crucify him. Away with him. Crucify him. So what's going on here? One minute, hands in the air, praising God. Throwing their coats on the ground. Looks like a revival's happening. A few days later, crucify him. One in blood, one in this man dead. It's because they're religious pretenders. They're religious pretenders. They're just like people who come to church and they recognize that Jesus is their king and can save them. And they want to be saved from certain problems in their life and they happily sing praises and wave hands in the air. You don't get people in church throwing coats on the ground. But what they don't do is turn to Jesus in repentance. They don't turn to Jesus and say, I'm a sinner. Save me of my sin. Have mercy on me. Open my eyes. I trust in you to save me from my sin. And it happens every Sunday all across the world. And it happened even in Jesus' day. So let's read on. Verse 10. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up 
saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. And quite possibly when they said prophet, they may have been thinking of the prophet that Moses prophesied about. 1,500 years before, Moses said, Deuteronomy 18:15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. So, 1,500 years before, Moses freed the people from the Egyptians. And now people are thinking, this guy, Jesus, the prophet, quite possibly the prophet Moses is talking about, I mean, I think that's what they thought, but it's just not strongly linked here in the text. But they're thinking, this guy is going to save us from the Romans. And they like that. But they don't want to repent of their sin. They don't want to bear fruit for Jesus. They just want him to destroy the Romans. They want him to start attacking the Romans. But look what happens instead. Verse 12. Does he attack the Romans? No. No. And Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. Now these are Jews in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. I mean, you can imagine it. One minute everyone's cheering. I mean, imagine what it would be like in this church service now. Everyone's worshipping, having a great time, going nuts, right? We've all got our tambourines and we're having a wonderful time, okay? And then I march up to the front of the church and I lift up this table and chuck it on the ground and I get those speakers and throw them over there. That would be a shock. That would be a shock. And maybe we read this Bible story so many times that we lose the shock factor of it. And realize one minute is always praise and worship, people throwing their cloaks on the ground, expecting him to overturn the Romans. First thing he does, goes into the temple where the religious people are, starts throwing stuff around. This would be a major shock. He doesn't go after the Romans. He goes after the religious people. And he's in the part of the temple where the Gentiles were supposed to be able to go in, the non-Jews. And instead of the non-Jews praying and talking to God and being with God, with God's people, in God's place, the temple, under God's rule, instead there's people trying to make money there, people trying to do a hustle. These people have been bad, they've been sinful and God's not happy. And what's going on here is there is a superstitious belief going on like what they had in the Old Testament, that as long as we got the temple, we're okay. You see that in the Old Testament. People thinking, we got the temple, we're okay. We worship other gods, but we got the temple. As long as we got the temple, we're cool. And I think a similar thing happens today. People think, as long as I go to church, I'll be all right. Some people think, as long as I put money in the offering, I'll be right with God. My heart can be far from God, but as long as I put money in, God will be happy with me. And it's this superstitious belief, this temple superstition that they had going on. But Jesus comes in and shows how disgusted he is at how they've been treating the temple. And again, this is a fulfillment of messianic prophecy. So check it out in Malachi chapter 3 verse 1. This is at the end of the Old Testament. The prophecy goes like this. Behold, I will send my messenger... And he will prepare the way before me. Well, that sounds a lot like what John the Baptist said, right? So John the Baptist has turned up, preparing the way for someone. So around those days, you've got to be thinking of this prophecy here and thinking Malachi 3.1. Well, it didn't have chapters and verses then, but you'd be thinking Malachi, you know, the messengers come and now the next bit's going to happen, which is, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So you would have thought the people would clean up the temple a bit and think, let's get rid of all this sin from the temple. But they don't. And Jesus does suddenly come to the temple and again show that he is the Messiah and shows that getting rid of the Romans is not his number one priority. But enabling the people to have true fellowship with God is. 
And then this next bit significant, verse 14. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Now you could easily skim over this and think, oh yeah, another healing story. Well, this is actually the last healing story we get. This is the last one and it's significant because he's in the temple. He's just purified the temple. He's got rid of all this money hustle going on. And now the blind and the lame come to him in the temple. Now most Jewish authorities wouldn't let the blind and the lame make sacrifices in the temple. They wouldn't let them because they were worried that the blind and the lame would defile the temple. They would think ceremonially they were dirty and they would make the temple dirty if they went in there to make sacrifices. But now Jesus is standing in the temple and they come to him and what Jesus is showing us here is that he doesn't get defiled by so-called dirty people. Remember, he's the guy who can touch a leper and he doesn't get leprosy himself. And the leper gets healed of his leprosy. And so Jesus is showing that he is actually more important than the temple, which would be amazing to Jews in those days because they were so into the temple. And Jesus is standing there and they're coming to him before they weren't able to go and make sacrifices to the temple. They were limited in how they could communicate with God. And now they can come right to Jesus, right there where the temple is, and Jesus is standing there as a sign that he is more important than the temple. And the people come to him and they are healed. And the things that made them unclean no longer make them unclean because Jesus makes them clean. Now that has amazing applications for us today. That means no one should ever think they're too dirty to come to Jesus Christ. You're never too dirty to come to Jesus Christ. You're never too sinful to come to Jesus Christ. Any time, night or day, you can go to Jesus and say, I'm sorry, make me clean. And realize that it's nothing about you that makes you clean. It's only Jesus. And he's the one who can touch you and he can cleanse you. And he, he's not afraid to do that. He touched lepers. He's not afraid to touch you and heal you. Just turn to him and ask him to save you. He's the only person in the world who will do that. And religious folk don't like this. I guarantee you, when this goes on the internet, there will be some people who will hear this and think, I don't like that. <laughs> he should tell everyone they need to be good people. They need to get themselves right. Well, that's what religious people say. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says, come to me. We have to go to him. He's the one who gives us forgiveness of sins and purifies us. And look at how these religious folk respond in verse 15. But when the chief priests and the scribes, these are the real religious people of the day, saw the wonderful things that he did. So they see these wonderful things. Blind people having their eyes open. Crippled people being able to walk. And this, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. So you've got children in the temple praising God. A few minutes before, there was just people making money. There were no kids praising God. Now there's kids praising God. There's sick people getting well. And it says they were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise. So these religious leaders are religious pretenders. They're pretending to be holy and righteous. They're pretending to be religious. But when an actual revival breaks out in the temple, they don't like it. And yet they had no problem with all the money that was being made earlier and the hustle that was going on. And, you know, we, we know from looking at historical sources that people were making money out of sacrifices. You know, people would travel to Jerusalem to make a sacrifice and then the person would say, you know what, the animals you bought aren't clean. You're going to have to buy one of my special clean animals. Oh, it's a bit pricey. <laughs> and then they would charge them a lot of money for the sacrifices. So people were doing a real, a real hustle. But the religious types didn't mind that. But they do mind when people start acknowledging Jesus 
and where Jesus starts making dirty people clean. And Jesus quotes Psalm 8 to them. And in Psalm 8, it says that God has prepared praise from infants and nursing babies. Babies that are still being, children that are still being breastfed. And he's saying God has prepared praise from them. So here we see God's sovereignty. God will make children praise him. God can even make the rocks cry out and praise him if he wants to. He can make sons of Abraham out of whoever he wants. And he's not doing it here with the religious types. And this reminds me of weeks and weeks ago we, when we looked in Matthew 11:25. You've got, at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. And we see exactly that thing going on here. And then verse 17, and leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. What a contrast. <laughs> a bit earlier, he's come into the city, people are throwing down their cloaks, praising him, realizing this is their king, and he doesn't stay there for the night. Now, Jerusalem would have been crowded at that time of year because of the Passover. Everyone's traveling to Jerusalem for the feast. But, come on, the king's just turned up. I mean, you're going to give him a room, right? Well, Jesus has decided he doesn't want to be there with them. He's obviously not happy with what's going on. Jesus can see the religious pretense going on. He sees the people praise, but he knows they're religious pretenders. And we see this next in what happens. Verse 18. In the morning, as he was returning to the city, he became hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the wayside, he went to it and found nothing on it but only leaves. And he said to it, May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withered at once. Now, if you want to get an idea of what's going on here, we can look at Mark's account of it as well. Mark 11:13 says, And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, so he sees a fig tree in leaf, this fig tree's got leaves on it, he went to see if he could find anything on it. So some, these leaves give the indication that he could find figs on it. So he goes up to it, and it says, When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. So he goes to it, there's no figs there, because it's not the season for figs. Now here's the thing, Jesus would know it wasn't fig season, yeah? I mean, he's brought up in this day and age, just like we know on a Saturday night at two in the morning, Asda is not open, right? We, we know that, we live around here, we know it's not the season for Asda in the early hours of Saturday night, Sunday morning. And Jesus would know that the fig trees don't have figs this time of year, and the fig trees wouldn't have had leaves on them. But there's this one fig tree that he sees and it's got leaves on it. So Jesus looks at it and thinks, that's got leaves on it. That looks like it might have figs. Even though it's out of season, it's giving the promise that there's figs there. And Jesus walks up to it and he, he enacts a parable, if you like. Rather than telling a parable, he actually acts this one out. And it's very powerful. Because when he gets there, he sees that although there's leaves promising there would be fruit, that there would be figs. In actual fact, there are no figs. And he's very unhappy about this, to the point that he curses the fig tree. And he says, you're not going to bear fruit again. May no fruit ever come from you again. And the fig tree withers. So what's going on? Jesus doesn't like it when something gives the impression it's bearing fruit, but doesn't bear fruit. He doesn't like it when something gives the impression of bearing fruit, but doesn't bear fruit. And isn't that just what we saw in Jerusalem? The people praising him, getting all excited, their king is here. There's a promise of fruit. But, just like John the Baptist said to the religious leaders of his day, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. It's not just about going out in the wilderness and having a crazy religious experience. It's not just about going to the temple and following Jesus. It's not about laying your cloaks on the ground and praising God. 
you need to repent and you need to live, live your life after that repentance in a way that shows you really did repent and you really did turn to God and there's fruit in your life. And Jesus goes to the temple and the temple has the impression of bearing fruit. It has the impression of being God's people in God's place under God's rule. And when he gets there, there's no fruit. There's just people making money, defiling the temple. And when he heals people, the religious people don't like that because they don't like seeing the fruit. And so that's what's going on here. And Jesus gives this curse and says, you won't bear fruit again. And tragically, we see what happens with Jerusalem in AD 70, just a few years later. Jerusalem is destroyed. And what happened to Jerusalem has got to be the most horrific thing that has ever happened to a city in the history of the world. You can read about it, read Josephus' account. There was even a very good documentary, can you believe it? I think it was uh, someone like Discovery or History Channel did a really good documentary on the account of Jerusalem, the siege at Jerusalem and what the Romans did, what the Jews did to their own people, people eating children during the siege. Jews eating their own children. And the temple was destroyed, and there's never been a temple since. And tragically, we see that God's judgment did come down upon Jerusalem. They were a people there who gave the impression of bearing fruit, an impression of loving God, but really their hearts were far from him. And we need to be careful that doesn't happen with us. Clearly, Britain is way past that stage now. Britain is not even pretending to bear fruit, although there are religious leaders in this country that are pretending. You see them in the news at the moment, you know, and it's tragic. And it makes me scared in the right way to live in this country, knowing how far from God we are. And it shows how we need to repent and we need to preach the gospel to people in England. And we need to make sure that we are living our lives right. That we really are trusting in Jesus, bearing fruit for Jesus because of what he did on the cross. Accepting him as the saviour that he came to be. Saving us from our sins. Not saving us from our self-esteem problems or saving us from our financial problems. Those are all byproducts of sin. Jesus saves us from sin. The other stuff is a minor, it's a secondary thing. God will take care of that as well. But the mission was to deal with our sin, to save his people from their sin. And we've got to make sure we've got that at the forefront of our minds, what happened at the cross of Jesus Christ. And so then the next day, and it, this seems to be kind of a second teaching point that is added in here. Verse 20, when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, how did the fig tree wither at once? And Jesus answered them, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Now notice all of that is based on faith. It's not based on ritual. It's not based on pretending to be religious, being a religious pretender. It's all based on faith. Having a true relationship with Jesus Christ where you trust in Jesus Christ. And this doesn't negate all the other verses in Scripture that talk about where Jesus talks about praying according to his name. In other words, praying according to his character, what he wants. Praying for the Father's will. So in other words, if you pray something that's not in God's will, that isn't going to happen. But if it's in God's will, it will happen. And I would suggest that you're wasting your time if you go to Snowdonia now and try and get Snowdonia lifted up and thrown into the sea. I doubt very much that God, that's God's will. If it is God's will, then, you know, so be it. But it's important to get all the different verses about prayer and put them together and not now think that if I pray that I'll be a millionaire tomorrow, it's going to happen. If it's God's will, it will happen. <laughs> but it may not be God's will. And God is much more concerned about me bearing fruit. And I'm sure God knows that if I'm a millionaire tomorrow, I'm probably not going to bear much fruit for him. I'm sure it would have a negative effect. I look at Solomon and I think, hmm, wouldn't want that. So let's sum this all up. What do we learn from this? We learn that Jesus promised a Messiah. 
Jesus Christ. That is the way we can be saved. I don't see everyone looking at the screen. There aren't going to be any points here. Sorry. My neighbors had a party yesterday, so it's limited in the amount of brain power I had for preparing this sermon. Um, God will not save any other way than through Jesus Christ. That's the only way. Don't fall for what you're hearing on TV at the moment about, well, God looks at their hearts and the Hindus and the Muslims and the Jews. It's all. No. Anyone who doesn't turn to Jesus Christ will not be saved. The only way to be saved is through Jesus Christ. That is not a, uh, a prejudiced way of thinking. That's just what the Bible says. Um, shouting out praises to God does not save you. Don't get me wrong. Shout out your praises to God in church, but let it come from what's going on in here, your relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't put on a front to make anyone else happy. They were doing that in Jerusalem. And they were praising God, but they, I think they were praising God for the wrong reason. They were praising God because they thought they were going to be freed from the Romans. Sometimes people praise God because they think God's going to save them from their money problems. You know, rather than praising God because he saved them from their sin. Realizing that God chose them, he saved them from their sin because of his mercy. That's a good enough reason to praise God. Remember that going to church doesn't save you. Again, I'm not saying don't go to church. You should go to church. But going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than going to McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. So go to church because you have a relationship with God and you want to meet with his people and you want to praise him. Being able to make theologically correct statements about Jesus does not save you. You know, there have been scholars who have been able to articulate the theology of Romans really well about substitutionary atonement, about imputed righteousness, but they don't believe it. And the application for us is, let's not be people that debate theology, discuss theology, but it never actually has any application in our life. You know, don't debate about the roles of men and women in church if you have no love for men or you have no love for women. It, it's silly. You might be right about what you think about gender roles, but if you have no love for the opposite sex, then you've totally missed God's intention. Don't debate about Calvinism if you're proud about the fact that you was elected. <laughs> that just shows you don't understand the doctrine of election at all. Don't debate about how to do evangelism and the right way of doing it if you never tell anyone at work or on the street about Jesus. There's no point. See, these are all ways that we can be religious pretenders. Don't debate about how the right way of doing worship if you never truly worship God from your heart. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying let's put theology aside. I'm not saying let's put doctrine aside, put exegesis aside. I'm saying let's study the word, but let's apply it in our lives. Let's ask Jesus to change our hearts so that we can apply his word in our lives. And let's all turn to Jesus in repentance for all our sin and ask for his mercy. And let's put our faith in Jesus Christ. That's what counts. And maybe you've done that before. But, you know, we can keep doing it. I heard a terrible thing that some, a friend of mine once said, which was that, you know, you only have to repent once. They said in the Bible, the word repentance is only used for non-believers. Well, no, it's not. I mean, I don't know who dreamt that up, but it's not true. You know, we, we can repent every day for all of our sin and turn to Jesus Christ and ask for mercy. And remember that even if society sees you as dirty, Jesus can make you clean. Jesus isn't looking for religious pretenders. He's actually looking for sick people who will say, Lord, open my eyes. So let's not be religious pretenders. Let's be true believers in Christ who have our lives changed and bear fruit for Christ because of the work of the cross of Jesus Christ who died and rose again three days later. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And it's so tragic that 
for so much of our lives, we've not seen you as you really are. And even now, we don't see you properly. I pray that you would open our eyes now, open our eyes to your glory, so that we would see how glorious you are and how amazing it is that you, the King of Kings, came to the earth as a man and was beaten and had your body killed, tortured and killed on a cross and your blood flowed for us because of your mercy. Open our eyes to that wonderful truth, Lord Jesus. We are sorry for our sin. We ask for your mercy. We ask for your mercy knowing that you do forgive. We thank you so much for forgiving us and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. Thank you that you make us dirty people clean, not because of anything good about us, but just because of you. I pray that you would do a work in our lives so that we would bear fruit for you, for the Father's glory. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would fill us up, that you would renew our minds, and that you would do mighty works through us. We pray that you would just cleanse us and our church from hypocrisy, from putting on religious fronts, from not applying scriptures to our own lives. I pray that you would be glorified in our church, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen.